The way I teach basic instrument flying is the same way I was taught 45 years ago. And when I use it to train my students, it seems very effective and many of them are amazed by the transformation in their skills. I really don't know why that is, because I would have thought that all instrument instructors would teach the same basic techniques. Yet so much of it seems to be new to so many students who've already been through a basic instrument flying course that I can only assume that either they haven't been trained properly or for some reason it hasn't sunk in. So I'm making this video to try to plug that gap and simply reproduce the basic training I give my students. This video is aimed at the bulk, but not the whole of the GA IFR community. It assumes a non-pressurised light aircraft lying somewhere between a Cessna 172 and a Navajo Chieftain. There is little difference in the training between six-pack instruments and glass, and I'll use examples from each. In later videos, I also intend to cover both OBS and HSI, and both RBI and RMI. This video only covers basic instrument flying. If it goes well and reaction is good, I'll do one on tracking, holding and approaches, both precision and non-precision. Later, if the COVID-19 lockdown continues long enough, I may cover autopilot, RNAV and PBN. For ease of production and distribution, I've made it as one continuous video, but I would strongly discourage you from watching it that way. Watch a section, then go practice, either on the aircraft or on the simulator. If you use a simulator, I recommend X-Plane and I strongly recommend using a force feedback yoke with the trimming set up as accurately as possible. Good force feedback yokes are expensive, but so is flying an aircraft and in my opinion, you'll save money by spending the money on a yoke than spending many hours practicing on the sim rather than in the air. X-Plane and Brunner have played no part in the creation of this video and are unaware that I'm making it. I recommend them only as a very satisfied customer. I will not benefit whether you buy their products or not. If you do have X-Plane, then I'm able to provide remote training anywhere in the world by connecting our X-Plane installations together and setting up a conference call. You can find me, Timothy Nathan, on the PPLIR Europe website. Before we start instrument flying, there are three preliminary exercises that should be done VFR, VMC. Firstly, fly along in VMC at your normal cruise settings. Adjust the aircraft symbol on the AI to be exactly in, the, uh, in alignment with the horizon. Um, then gently change your altitude by 100 feet, first up, then down. Consciously notice and internalize the size of your attitude change in the windscreen and in the AI. Do this a few times until you have a feel for how the pitch on the AI compares with the real horizon. Try to memorise what you've discovered. And then the second exercise, still in VMC VFR, teach yourself to trim absolutely perfectly so that the aircraft flies hands off and remains at exactly the correct altitude and the correct heading. Um, as I'll discuss later, um, use the rudder trim to prevent any yaw or wing drop. Practice the trimming at different speeds, um, in climb and descent, in different co configurations of flaps uh, and gear, and in turns until you can do it all intuitively. A bit later in the video, I talk about trimming techniques, and it's worth watching that bit before you do this exercise. And the third important exercise is to determine power settings for different configurations. You probably already know the power setting for climb and cruise. Indeed, there are probably AFM or POH um, instructions. Um, so most of this exercise is actually going to be about setting settings for the descent. So take a careful note of the power setting, either RPM or MAP, um, as appropriate for your type. Personally, I tend to keep cruise power in the initial descent and just go faster. But if you don't have a turbocharged aircraft, you'll, you'll want to gradually throttle back as you descend. Now fly at 2000 feet and lower approach flaps, but with the gear up if, apl if applicable. Adjust power so that you're flying at the speed you would normally fly an approach, which is typically um, a bit faster than VREF. For IFR touring aircraft, it might be around 100 to 120 knots. 
for twins and turboprops about 120 to 130 knots. Now make a careful note of that power setting. If you have retractable gear, lower it and allow the nose to drop at about 500 feet per minute. You'll probably find um, that the power setting is the same as in level flight without the gear, but if you need to adjust it, make a note. If you have fixed gear, reduce the power but leave the trim alone um, and discover the power setting necessary to descend at 500 feet per minute. Keep a careful note on that, of that power setting. You're going to need these settings later. Of course, you'll need to go through, through these exercises for each aircraft type you fly, um, and wh whether in reality or on the sim. So let's start on how to fly on instruments. The first big lesson is that you should focus as much attention as possible on the attitude indicator. Whatever else you are doing, changing frequency, looking at plates and charts, going through checklists or whatever, it's back to the AI. If the AI is in the right place, nothing else can go wrong. If it is very slightly in the wrong place, then other things such as altitude and heading may go slightly wrong, but very slowly. So if you have other tasks to perform and have limited spare capacity, don't even bother with the other instruments. Just keep darting your eyes back to the AI. Then, when your capacity increases again, you can expand your scan to other instruments to check that you're still exactly on altitude and heading. A lot of instrument pilots who've not been well taught have forgotten what they were taught or have simply slipped into bad habits, chase the instruments, which effectively means that they are perpetually in a state of pilot-induced oscillation. This is usually at its worst on the ILS, where the pilot is trying and inevitably failing to follow the ILS indications directly, rather than starting with the AI, then looking at the heading and rate of descent and only occasionally at the ILS indications. There is a pyramid hierarchy with the AI on top, the performance instruments, altimeter, DI, ASI and BSI in the middle, and the navigation instruments, HSI, OBS, ADF at the bottom. Any adjustments you want to make to a performance instrument, such as changing altitude, is achieved on the AI, then checked on the altimeter. Taking that one step further, if you want to adjust on the ILS, you determine the new heading, but again you execute the plan on the AI. Once you've grasped that concept, you will transform your instrument flying and indeed be able to make it an unconscious skill like driving your car where you're no longer having to think about the instruments, but can free your mind to do other tasks like planning and management. So the AI is the king of instruments and you use it to make any adjustments. If your altitude is wrong, you look at the AI to change pitch slightly, then you wait before next looking at the altitude because you are flying pitch attitude, not altimeter. You then readjust the attitude back to level flight. The same is true if the heading needs adjustment. You correct on the AI, then when back on the heading, go back to straight and level on the AI. It must be emphasised that changes to the AI to make corrections are very small. As I hope you discover when you do the VMC experiment I suggested earlier, the amount of pitch change as indicated on a classic mechanical AI is very small, often as little as a millimetre. It's a precision tool. Also, an important point about the reliability of the AI. We place our complete trust in them. Indeed, we trust them with our lives and the lives of our families. But sadly, they can and do go wrong. And the most common failure, particularly on light singles, which only have one vacuum pump, uh, is the vacuum supply. And we should check the vacuum gauge on a regular basis, maybe with Frieda checks, maybe more often. These days, with standby hori electric horizons being so cheap, I would suggest that all aircraft should have an independent backup instrument. If you rent, you might like to have a look at the many low-priced AHARS units, which can give you a good attitude indication on your phone or tablet. Once you have this technique mastered, it's remarkable how long you can leave it between looking at any other instruments. When I'm training my students, I cover up all the other instruments, or on the sim, zoom right into the, the AI, and get them to fly the AI super accurately for maybe 60 seconds. In that time, and it is a long time, 
they rarely end up more than 50 feet or five degrees off. So to reiterate, if you keep the attitude correct, everything else remains correct. The easiest way to ensure the attitude remains correct, even when you look away, is for the aircraft to be completely in trim. The technique for trimming is often referred to by instructors as select hold trim. Select the attitude you want, hold the attitude, feel what controlled inputs you need and trim those forces away. I recommend students never to have more than one finger and one thumb on the yoke. That makes it very easy to feel whether you need to be pulling a little with your finger or pushing a little with your thumb to, remain attitude, to maintain attitude. You then unload that pressure with small adjustments to the trim until the pitch attitude is exactly right to maintain the performance required, normally level, but the same is true for climb and descent, without any pressure on the yoke. This is why it's so important in the sim to have force feedback controls. You also need to trim to fly straight. Most of us are not lucky enough to have aileron trim on our aircraft. That generally comes in the higher end of the Cessna 172 to Navajo range we're talking about. Having said that, my own aircraft does have, an, have aileron trim, but I can't remember the last time I used it, so it's not a great boom. But we nearly all have rudder trim, and I recommend using that to ensure that neither wing drops. Some purists might argue that the ensuing configuration may be a bit out of balance, and that, there is, and that that is obviously a bad thing, but I disagree. If the amount of out of balance you create by using the rudder to keep the wings level is more than a smidgen, then I suggest that you ground the aircraft until you discover why. Either the balance ball is not level on the panel or your airframe is twisted. If on the other hand it's only a smidgen, then the effect on performance and passenger comfort will be negligible, and the safety and workload benefit of keeping you flying straight even when you're not looking at the AI or have your hands on the controls is enormous. In extremis, it could save your life as it prevents a spiral dive when you're distracted. So, I've talked about maintaining an attitude and the importance of trim to put in the minimum of control input to keep both level and straight. The next obvious step is to say that once the aircraft is trimmed, any control input from the pilot is likely to have a negative rather than beneficial effect. So the next exercise is to practice getting the aircraft or the simulator perfectly in trim, then just letting go. You should be able to get to the point where you can leave it untouched for maybe 60 to 90 seconds without your heading changing by more than five degrees or your altitude by 50 feet. Remember not to react to small changes in attitude, altitude or heading because the natural stability of the aircraft will generally fix them. Just watch and see what happens. And that, of course, is a game changer. If you can reliably take your hands off the yoke to do other stuff, like look for a plate or even eat a sandwich, then instrument flying has suddenly transformed into a non-event. I once sent a student off for his initial IR, and the feedback was that while it was good to see that he was relaxed and accurate, the examiner did not approve of him actually having his arms folded across his chest as he flew the ILS to minima. I don't recommend this, I only mention it to emphasise how relaxed instrument flying can be. Staying with the attitude indicator, let's move on to the next issue where I may differ from some traditionalists, but where I've found a technique that students can really latch onto and produces great results. As far as I'm concerned, the AI should always be showing one of nine pictures. Three positions in pitch times three in roll. Let's start with pitch. In every aircraft in the 172 to Navajo range that I've flown, there are only three places where pitch should be. Level, eight degrees nose up, and two and a half degrees nose down. Those pitches give you the performance you want. On a traditional vacuum mechanical AI, it can be quite difficult to pitch accurately, particularly in some models where pitch angle isn't marked. You may just have to remember, or if you own the aircraft, mark it on the instrument, the, the three pitches. This is one of the great benefits of glass, where pitch is multiplied to be much clearer and easier to pitch within half a degree. The first pitch, level, should be self-evident, though there's a little bit more to say in the minute. If your AI has a movable aircraft symbol, then you should carefully set it such that it reads level at cruise speed, and then leave it alone. In any of the aircraft in our range, the climb position of 8 degrees nose up gives the speed and rate of climb parameters you want at full power, or, in more powerful aircraft, climb power. 
If you're familiar with Flight Director, you'll be aware that there is a takeoff go around or toga button to be pressed before takeoff or in the go around. When you press toga, the command bar goes straight to 8 degrees nose up, and that is what you're expected to fly. Obviously, you need to get the engine cooling right on very hot days, and you might need to lower the nose and fly faster. Uh, and sometimes nearby terrain means that you want the best angle of climb at the, at the expense of forward progress and engine parameters. But put those exceptions out of your mind while you build your skills. Put the nose at eight degrees in the climb and things will work out for you. Similarly, in an unpressurized light aircraft, there are a small range of rates of descent that you will ever want to achieve. For your en route descent, you want to descend at 500 feet per minute. That is simply because you want to reduce the rate of descent as much as possible for the sake of your passenger's ears, but the minimum rate of descent permitted in an IFR controlled environment is 500 feet per minute. That is to say, when you're clear to descend, unless the controller uses an expression like descend when ready or at your convenience, then he is planning for you to start your descent promptly and descend at a minimum of 500 feet per minute. So we want the minimum rate of descent for passengers, and that minimum is 500 feet per minute. In, ev in every aircraft, in the range of aircraft we're talking about, that I have ever flown, that 500 feet per minute is achieved at two and a half degrees nose down. However, as we're going to discuss later, other rates of descent are required for final approach. In a slow aircraft or in strong headwinds, that rate of descent can be as little as 250 feet per minute though most of the time in most of the IFR aircraft we're talking about is more typically around 450 to 600 feet a minute. But the great thing is, it seems that in the Cessna 172 to Navajo range we're discussing, a three degree approach with approach flap and gear extended is achieved at the desired speed by setting two and a half degrees nose down. Now, whether that is because of the basic laws of aerodynamics or because it is is a design rule or whether it's a conspiracy on the part of designers, I can't say. But the upshot is that the only pitch angle you need for descent is two and a half degrees nose down. So I promised you three pitch positions and you have them. Eight degrees nose up, zero and two and a half degrees nose down. But I also promised three angles of bank. Firstly, you need to know that all IFR turns are made at rate one which is to say three degrees per second, 180 degrees per minute, or two minutes to turn through 360 degrees. The only exception is if you get the instruction avoiding action, in which case you make a rate two turn, but I've, I've only had that instruction once in 45 years of IFR flying, so we can safely ignore uh, that in basic training. And I say again, all IFR turns are rate one. When flying rate one turns, I teach my students not to refer to the turn coordinator or turn needle, to make the, but to make the turn on attitude only. There is a simple equation to calculate angle of bank for a rate one turn. Divide your airspeed by 10 and add seven. That means that at 100 knots, you need 17 degrees, 120 knots, 19, and 140 knots, 21 degrees. 100 to 140 knots is a big range of airspeeds, yet the difference in angle of bank is only four degrees. Furthermore, the most important time to fly accurate turns is in procedures and holds, and most of our type of aircraft are going to fly those at between 120 and 140 knots. Admittedly, that doesn't include the bottom of the range, the normally powered Cessna 172 and PA-28, but it's good for higher powered versions of those airframes like the Skyhawk and Arrow, which are much more likely to be used in an IFR environment and right up to the Navajo. So if we're flying at 130 knots, the angle of bank for a rate one turn is 130 divided by 10, 13, plus seven is 20 degrees. At 110 knots, it's 18 degrees. So you know what I'm going to say. The only three angles of roll you're going to use IFR are 20 degrees left, centralized and 20 degrees right. I promised you a range of three and that is there. Thus you have three attitudes in pitch and three in roll. That gives you a total of nine pictures you're going to see on your AI. Straight and level, straight climb, straight descent, left turn, right turn, climbing left turn, climbing right turn, descending left turn, descending right turn. 
And why have I explained that, that at such great length? Because I want you to internalise, remember and thoroughly grasp that if you're looking at a picture that does not match one of those nine, you should be asking yourself why. And 99% times out of 100, the response should be to put the AI on one of the nine positions. Providing it's matched by climb, cruise or descent power as appropriate, then those pictures are going to keep you safe and performing well. Now, I've been a little disingenuous because there are going to be times when you're making small corrections to altitude and heading, when you'll be making small changes in pitch and roll. But nonetheless, it's a very good rule of thumb to always be one in, in one of those nine slots. They will fix any mess you've got into and at any rate not makes matters worse. Finally, before we leave pitch attitudes, I said earlier that you should set the aircraft symbol to normal cruise straight and level. But there will be times when you're flying straight and level slower, for example in the hold, or faster, for example against a headwind. Just like when you use external references in VMC, as you slow down, you need to raise the nose. In glass, the pitch angles are clear and it's easy to memorise your attitude in terms of degree. But on the small AI usually fitted to small aircraft, it can be more tricky. In this example, there are no pitch markings at all. I've seen this in older small, air, uh, small pipers many times. They make life much more difficult. In my experience, the best thing to do is to have an inner voice saying things like, the orange is just touching the white, or the blue is the same width as the orange and the white. It might sound a bit silly as I say it now, but it works in flight when you have a lot of, have a lot of other things to think about. The same but opposite is true in high speed flight, except that pitch angles are smaller, so you might be saying the orange is halfway down the white. But let us now move on to bringing the other instruments into the scan. In the case of the six pack, that means the other five instruments are arranged around, around the AI. In the case of a glass PFD, it means taking notes of the tapes and HSI, but the effect is much the same. As I've already said, if you are doing other things, you only need to glance back at the AI. But when you are focusing on accurate instrument flying, you need to ensure that, as appropriate for the stage of flight, altitude, heading, airspeed and rate of descent are also exactly right. These instruments are called performance instruments because they measure the performance we are achieving. And I mean exactly right. As we'll be discovering later, when I'm talking about procedures, it's much easier to fly very accurately than it is inaccurately. There are two reasons for that. One reason is that if you deviate, you have to correct and then go back to where you were. That's two things that are going to occupy your brain cells, whereas just staying in the right place in the first place is easier. The second reason is that if you start a procedure at the wrong altitude or pointing in the wrong direction, everything else goes to pot. Take, for example, the descent on a two-dimensional approach without vertical guidance. If you start at the correct altitude and adopt the correct rate of descent, which we'll see later is easily calculated, you will float through each check altitude correctly. But if you start at the wrong altitude, even by 50 feet, you'll be constantly recalculating and adjusting all the way down, taking your attention from horizontal tra tracking and checks. Your workload will be a lot higher than if you had just got it right in the first place. So our aim is to fly as accurately as possible with the minimum effort. We've already established that the attitude indicator is the master instrument and very much the focus of our attention. We use a technique called radial scan to bring in the other instruments. That means looking at the AI, then across to a performance instrument or tape, then back to the AI and then onto another performance instrument and so on. But we're trying to use the minimum effort and having to scan all the other instruments every time is an unwarranted effort. For example, if we're flying straight and level, at a steady power setting, do we need to check the airspeed as often as the altitude? Of course not. We might want to check it every so often to check for icing or pitot blockage, for example, but in straight and level flight, it's not going to change, so there's no point focusing on it. So that thought takes us away from the concept of the radial scan to the technique we really need, the selective radial scan. The selective radial scan takes out of our scan the instruments that are not useful for what we're currently doing, leaving us only with those that are really informative. Before we start looking at specific selective radial scans, a word about bugs. 
Bugs make the scan so much easier, so use whatever bugs you have. Most of us have heading bugs, but those of us with glass will also have altitude, airspeed, vertical speed bugs. You should always use whatever bugs you have because they make the scan so much easier. Personally, and this really is a personal choice, I leave my airspeed bug on 130 knots, not because I'm always flying at that speed, but because that's my preferred speed at the times when I'm monitoring it, in the climb, in procedures and on the approach. The easiest example of selected radial scan is straight and level. What do we need to know to ensure that we are straight and level? Well, the clue's in the name. The DI, with its heading bug set, tells us if we are straight, and the altimeter, with its bug on the glass tape, tells us if we're level. So the selective radial scan for straight and level is AIDI, AI altimeter, AIDI, AI altimeter, and so on. We occasionally look at the other instruments, including engine instruments and navigation instruments, but our focus is just on those three. We do not make the rookie mistake of trying to use the VSI to stay level. It's too laggy to be useful. It's only useful in a steady state in a descent. Let's have a look at some other scans. When we're in a level turn, we don't need to keep looking at the DI because it's going to be some time before we reach our desired heading. So the only performance instrument we need in the turn is the altimeter. But most of us need altitude more than usual because we need some back pressure in the turn. So we enter the turn, uh, we automatically and immediately raise the nose a tiny bit, maybe one degree. But it's difficult to judge and that's why we need to look very often at the altimeter. So the selective radial turn in, scan in the turn is AI altimeter, AI altimeter. In the climb, we are generally mainly concerned that we don't go too slowly, both because we want to avoid stalling and spinning, but also because the aircraft we're talking about almost exclusively have air-cooled engines, where the combination of high power for the climb and low airspeed can soon result in excessive CHDs. Thus, we climb at a planned airspeed. We still need to remain straight, so we also have the DI in our scan, but in our kind of aircraft, we climb at about six to 800 feet a minute. So if we are climbing at, say, 3,000 feet, it's going to be three or four minutes before we get there. So there's really no point in scanning the altimeter to start with, though we gradually introduce it as we get close and transition to straight and level. So the selective radial scan for the climb is AIDI, AIASI, AIDI, AIASI, and so on. In the descent, as we said earlier, our considerations are different. Obviously, we need to go, keep going straight, but our focus is also on vertical speed. In the cruise descent, we want this to be exactly 500 feet a minute. In the approach, we want it to be whatever we calculate to maintain the glide slope. As with the climb, it's going to be some time before we reach our desired altitude or decision altitude, so we can safely not include the altitude in the scan initially, gradually in including it as we get closer. So the selective radial scan for the descent is AIDI, AIVSI, AIDI, AIVSI, and so on. Although climbing and descending turns might seem to be the most complex of our basic instrument skills, from the point of view of scan, they're actually the easiest. The reason being that in climbing turns, you only need to scan airspeed because it's a while before you reach heading or altitude. And in descending turns, you only need to scan rate of descent. Indeed, during climbing and descending turns, I tend initially only to really focus on the AI because the rest looks after itself then you must gradually introduce heading and altimeter as you approach your target, which leads me to anticipation. It's obvious, I hope, that if you approach a position with a rate of change and only change your attitude when you arrive, you will overshoot. This doubles your workload as you now have to reintercept from the other side and then correct onto your desired altitude, heading, track or whatever. So for crisp, accurate and low workload instrument flying, you must anticipate your target and start to make adjustments as you get close. My experience of lower skilled instrument pilots is that while some don't anticipate at all and increase their workload, 
most anticipate too soon and end up increasing their workload by making a number of small adjustments. Anticipation is going to depend on speed, momentum, and in the case of tracking, which we'll move on to in the next video, the angle of turn. But for the range of aircraft we are talking about, the Cessna 172 to Navajo, we can certainly start with some rules, or th rules of thumb. In climb or descent, some people suggest using 10% of the rate of climb or the rate of descent. So 500 feet a minute translates into 50 feet. By all means, try that. But it's also going to depend on the inertia of the aircraft and I've found that it's a little too much. I would suggest trying 30 feet for starters. It might be 20 feet for a Cessna 172 and 40 feet for a Navajo, but it's not going to be far off. So maintain the 8 degrees pitch up or 2.5 degrees pitch down all the way to 30 feet from your target altitude. Then gently but positively move the AI to your known level attitude and the altimeter will settle at the desired altitude. If you're climbing relatively slowly, uh, that's say if your airspeed is relatively slow, then you may need to adopt a pitch up attitude appropriate to that lower speed, then gently lower the nose as the speed builds up. Remember to keep the climb power on until you've reached the cruise speed. 30 feet may not seem much, but if you use more, you'll be fighting your way to the correct altitude for a lot longer. In the turn, I would anticipate by five degrees which usually is also conveniently the width of half the heading bug. So again, fly a 20 degree bank angle until you reach five degrees to go, then roll the wings gently but positively to level. In some aircraft, a tiny dab of outer turn rudder also helps. The DGI or HSI to settle on the desired heading. That's all I have to say about basic instrument flying. As I said at the beginning, if the reaction to this video is good, I'll go on to make more about tracking, holding, approaches, autopilot, glass and PBN. If you are an IFR pilot in Europe or aspire to become one, please join PPLIR Europe, the home of European GA IFR, and get loads more material on all sorts of IFR issues access to our forums when any IFR or touring question can be asked, access to our database of experiences at airfields around Europe and beyond, our seminars, fly-ins and much more. See you in the next video.